Well, good morning, Fusion Madison. Let's stand to our feet. Let's worship the Lord this morning, shall we? Well, come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more, yeah. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for, yeah. God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Bring all your failures. Bring all your failures. Bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. See his open
Let these words sing over you today. But everything is wrong, and I want to make it right. When it seems injustice has the final word. When I want to run away or take up my sword and fight. I just can't sit and watch the way we heard. 
tell you what, let's just bow our head, close our eyes all around the room this morning. And uh, I know that, I know that uh, it started as of last week and um, this week we watched more of it unfold. Uh, I've been getting questions and text messages about what's going on in our world right now. And today I just... Rather than, rather than, 
I just want to kill that video. Can we just kill that video, please? I want to, I want to pray for Israel and for what, what's going on in our world right now. Um, I know a lot of people are worried and that we have things going on that uh, Russia and, and Ukraine are at war now. Now this is going on with Israel. I mean, so much so. I'll just tell you how, how crazy my week has been. I've got, a, I've got a young lady that lives in one of the places that I own, and she called me, and she said, I've, I've got I've to I've quit on my lease, and she is a, a, a soldier for, she, she's, she's an Israeli Jewish woman, and she's got to go back, and uh, 20, 23, 24 years old, family's already fighting, and she's heading back, um, and it, it just kind of makes it real, you know, to to know uh, this is gonna this impacts people all over the world and um, obviously I've had people talk about end times and things that are going on but uh, I'll just tell you what the, the, the only thing I know to do is just go before the Lord and so I, I, I'm gonna have Reverend L come today before we get started in our conversation I'm gonna have him just come Charles you can come on and sit and uh, let's just agree together in prayer today I just want you to lift your voice wherever you are. The Lord said, those who bless Israel will be blessed, and those who curse him, he will curse them. They are your brothers and sisters. You are grafted into them. You might be a million miles away. You are the same through the blood of Jesus Christ. So I want you to open your mouth right now for just one minute and pray for Israel. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just, just let it flow. Let it pray, for, pray from your heart. Pray from your heart. From your heart. Father, you hear the cry of your children right now. Father, you hear, you listen, oh God, you take action. As your children are crying out to you, Lord, on behalf of our brothers and sisters, Lord. Father, we pray today, God, that you will deliver victory. You will deliver victory, Lord. And Father, we come against the prince of Persia. We come against the prince of darkness that is operating in that region, Lord. This morning, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, we take dominion over their activities and their works right now. Father, we destroy that spirit of violence and murder that's killing children. Father, today, in Jesus' name, we silence that power right now. Lord, be glorified in this. Let souls be saved. Let there be a revival breaking forth as a result of what is happening around the world now. That people will know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, this morning, we ask you to be glorified in our midst. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. 
Amen. 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 You can go ahead and be seated today. And uh, you know what? Just continue to pray and continue to just believe God for what he can do. And that uh, as Reverend L prayed that revival would, would break out from this, that people would turn back to the Lord and or turn to the Lord for the first time and really begin to ask questions and, and seek the Lord. And uh, let's just believe good things can come from this. We're going we're gonna to get into our discussion today, and it's interesting because as I was talking with Pastor Charles and, and, and Reverend L, uh, we talked a lot about Israel because uh, our topic of today, our hot potato for today is, uh, is, is really racism and all that entails, and, and you know, whether, whether or not it exists in the church. Um, I, think we, I, I think there's no, there's no argument that it exists outside of the church, um, and even watching what's going on with, with the, the nation of Israel, th- th- this is a group of people that have, you know, the enemy has been trying to extinguish them from planet Earth for centuries, millennia, really. And uh, that war comes out of really one household. Um, if you know the history of, of, of Abraham and, and Sarah and Hagar, uh, out of your Old Testament, uh, Isaac was the son of promise, and out of Isaac comes Judaism and Christianity. And when, uh, when Sarah and Abraham didn't see the promise fulfilled fast enough, uh, Sarah told Abraham to go be with his maidservant Hagar. Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. Ishmael is where, is where Islam comes from. Uh, and so it's a, it's a house divided against itself, and it's a war within, within a household, clear back from the Old Testament, uh, claiming supremacy over a region of planet Earth, you know, a, a, a country that literally... Uh, I feel like could fit inside Richland County. I mean, this is the smallest patch of earth, uh, and there's a, there's war over it constantly, and uh, and so we do see we do see that there's still hatred alive in the world today, um, and we know that there are uh, there are things that we're constantly doing to try to 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 end uh, racism. And uh, I'm I'm going to start off by just saying a few things, and then I'm just going to I'm going to I'm just going to ask questions and let Reverend L and Pastor Charles talk today. Um, God, God does not like us finding reasons to dislike one another. Um, he j- it's just it's just not it's just not him, and uh, and 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 we do it from from a young age. You, you know, we if, if somebody wears glasses, if somebody's too too if they're overweight, if they're skinny, if they have braces, if they have crooked teeth, um, if they got the wrong skin color, we find reasons to divide one another and. Um, to make fun of one another, and so I'll just start off by saying we we recognize in this in this church and really in the body of Christ that God does not want us to find reasons to dislike, hate, or have animus toward one another. And uh, so today we're going to talk about one specific area. And Martin Luther King Jr. said that 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 Sunday, I believe he said Sundays at eleven uh, eleven a.m is the most segregated hour in America. And that was in the middle of the civil rights movement that he said that. And unfortunately, still in our country today, all of these years later, decades later, and after so much movement uh, in our country and even inside the body of Christ, it still is the most segregated time and day of the week. Uh, there still are predominantly white churches in our country, and there are predominantly black churches in our country. And that statement that he made all those years ago is really still a true statement today. And so uh, one of the things that we can choose to do is we can choose to ignore the reality of, of, of where we're at. We can choose to ignore that, that, that there's still a problem, uh, or we can have difficult conversations. And difficult conversations are terrible. They're uncomfortable. They're never fun. Uh, but but I, I often think conversations that we, that we don't have is what leads to the problems that we continue to have. Um, and so uh, that's the conversation we want to have today. Difficult conversation uh, with some wonderful men of God and uh, that I trust and that, that I'm just going to let talk. So I'm going to start off with, with the, kind of the very first question. And uh, Reverend, I'll let you jump in on it is, you know, where does this idea, where does racism really come from? What's the foundation of it? What's the roots of it? And uh, how do you see it? How do you see that it unfolds? You're going you're gonna to need this. <laughs> I, know, I know you speak up, but we're going we're gonna to have you talking to the microphone today. Well, that's uh, 
a loaded question. That's what I'm going for. <laughs> the fact is that we can pinpoint the particular time that racism started. But when you go back in the scriptures, we find that God created one race of humanity. Adam and Eve. And every one of us come from Adam and Eve. No matter what color you have or what skin color pigmentation that you have. But as I was thinking about this and uh, looking at uh, the history that I know of, I can say that uh, racism probably started in the 13th and 14th century. And that was when, in England, when King George I, King Edward I, expelled all the Jews out of England. And so, because they were considered they were devils, so drove them out of England. And then comes the 14th through the 17th century, which is the period of Renaissance and the Reformation. And about this period, then that's when the slave trade began to happen. When the Europeans began to expand their horizon and then getting down to see that, wait a minute, there's a lot of things that's going to benefit us. And so they come up with what they call the three C's. Christianization, civilization, and commercialization. So they are going into the world to Christianize because they are heathens. And they are going to uh, civilize them because they're savages. And we are going to commercialize because we need the resources of the world that is found especially in the African region. So the European countries now began to colonize most of the world. Britain, Britain has a lion's share and they colonize most of all Africa and all the way to India. And so then with, the, with that slave trade continued and then as you get into America, it becomes a different history. So I was half more to say if uh, Charles, I defer to you. Oh, well, thank you, Reverend Al. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and when I was doing my research on this, when we were discussing this, I, I prayed about it. And then I started just to look up things and ask questions with my mother and other pastors that I know. And as it says in the <coughs> dictionary, racism is a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities that racial differences produce and inherit superiority of a particular race. So where does it come from? Like all evil that men do, it comes from the heart of man. Once again, it comes from the heart of man. Matthew 15, 19 says, for out the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immortality, theft, false testimony. Sexual immorality, immortality is a whole. Well, you know what I'm saying. We'll, we'll talk about that another time. But in all actuality, it comes from the heart of man. Yeah. Such evil in man's heart, evil like racism. Racism, I mean, it influences all his attempts to justify his supposed to superiority over his brother, over his sister. So according to the word of God, this is a spirit of murder. So like Reverend L said, when they did it back in, those, in that time, and I researched that, my mouth dropped. Mm -hmm. It didn't become true race until later in life. Mm -hmm. So when they brought other people over, it was like, hey, y'all just gonna come work for me. They didn't see color, but it didn't come into color to what, probably like 17, 1800s probably. 
So. <laughs> it is important also all for us to understand that uh, as Acts chapter 17, 24 through to 27 says that God created all the human race from one man, Adam and Eve. And as we talk about where the racism started, it started from the heart of the enemy devil. He became the king of the world when he was kicked out of heaven and so planted the evil in the hearts of men who told Cain to kill his brother. They were the only two kids that were born at the time. So when you see racism, you see evil. Mm -hmm. When you see murder, all of them are evil and originated from the heart of the enemy devil. And as many as he's using to accomplish his purpose are those who allow him and give him the, the permission to do it. Especially Christians. If you're born again, if you're living that life of racism or whatever, then you are listening to the lies of the devil who's your father. I'm sorry to say sometimes people, we don't want to hear hard words. He is not in the truth and he never speaks the truth and every word out of his mouth is lie. Mm -hmm. But that's not the same with Jesus. And if Jesus is in us and we know that we are his offspring, then... We should speak the truth against racism and all of that. Yeah. I know, I know for me, I've, I mean, I've seen racism in, in, in the church, and I don't want to go into great t detail where, um, but I, I definitely have heard words and things said through the years that shocked me uh, to the place where, you know, as a young man, a young Christian, I'm thinking, how in the world, how in the world can this be coming out of the mouth of people that are Christians? Um, and there's a lot of people that have used, there's a lot of people that have used religion and Christianity as, as an excuse mm -hmm. um, to be able to, 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 to perpetrate this, this sort of thing. Um, and there's, you know, there's slavery in the Bible. People will point to those sorts of things in the Bible. And um, the reality is the Bible tells the, the story of sinful man, not just, not just Father God and the wonderful things that God's mm -hmm. done. It also mm -hmm. tells the awful things of why God's necessary. Um, it, it, you know, through the years I've, I've, and I want to get into this part of it. Through the years I've heard people, you know, try to say things to, to, to not sound racist. And, and you know, um, one of the things that I hear a lot of people say, uh, and I kind of disagree with it. I want to see what you guys' stance is. I, I, I hear people say, well, I don't see color. I don't see color. And I think I know what they mean by that. Um, but do, do you think God sees color? I say God does see color. I mean, God is not colorblind. I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, God knows and loves all Christians of different colors. Doesn't mean he doesn't love me more because I got a better tan than you. <laughs> but he sees the shade of our skin. And in my opinion, I feel he believes this is part of his beautiful creation. So to say God doesn't see color uh, is implying that God is not acknowledging us as people for our struggles, black or white, because we're all going to go through some form of racism. I might just get hit with it a little bit harder. I got hit with it last night. DJing, just minding my own business. <laughs> a guy comes up to me. He says, you got to feel out of place. And I'm like, huh? He said, excuse me. He said, well, with all these hillbillies, I know you just used to playing all that rap music. And I kind of just looked at him and smiled. And I just started praying for the man. And then afterwards, he comes up to me and he said, well, you proved me wrong. I said, no, God laid it in your heart and he proved you wrong. Just because of the color of my skin doesn't mean nothing. My tan is just tight. That's it. <laughs> That's all it Do people is. people still say tight? Is that still a... Listen, you know what? what? Shardiger does, but... <laughs> I mean, here's the whole thing. This is how God made me. You know, I and I'm full of smiles, and I just take life as it is because 
we're all going to go struggle. God took great care of making all of us. And as it says in Psalms, and Reverend L., he didn't say this to me, but for some odd reason, I was thinking Psalms 139, 14. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. We are all made in the image of God, as you said. And nothing about this is a mistake. I feel God wanted his children to be all different, and we are. So if you are racist, that means you don't love God, in my personal opinion. Because he doesn't, he may be, he sees color, but that means you are basically dogging his creation mm. and hating on his creation. That's, that's, good. That's, 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 that's strong, but I think it's good. Um, the reason I asked that question, you know, one of the things we talked about as we were talking about this is if God didn't see, if God didn't see color and, and it didn't matter to him, why did he create so many different colors of roses? You know, it, I, yep. I, it, I mean, it's, it's, they're all roses, but why are there white ones and yellow ones and red ones? And, and do you really think you're going to get to heaven and heaven is just going to be this gray, you know, just ugly, bland? It's not going to be like that. You know, it's going to be this, this beautiful, amazing, gorgeous place and it's going to have diversity in it. And, and, but yet it's going to work in harmony. One thing I want to add there is go for uh, it. If anybody here or somebody who is listening to me right now, and you said you don't see color, it's because you don't have the eyes of God. Amen. If you have the eyes of God, you will see like God sees. Just drive down this road here, and you see the trees even display colors mm -hmm. right now. There are so many colors of the trees there because God made them. And when you have the eyes of God, and I say, child of God, you will have his own eyes. You know how you say, man, you got your daddy's eyes, or you got your mama's eyes when people look at you. You need to be said uh -oh. about you have your father's eyes, yeah. which is God. So we see, I see color because he made colors and he did not make any mistake. But the color that I want to kind of dispute a little bit here this morning is that you look at me, you say he's a black man. You look at him, he's a white man. Pastor Aaron is a white man. What's the color of this? <laughs> Just give Somebody me a couple more me. winter months and I'll be that color. Somebody tell me. <laughs> is Pastor Aaron white? I am black, right? Even though you got better tan than I do, but you're not as dark. <laughs> this is this is black. You're not that black. So I'm not going to say what I'm saying. Uh, where do you go? I mean, I, I, what do you, you do? know what? I mean, I think I understand what Reverend Hell is saying. That's black. I'm just brown. Good and brown. I'm good and brown. Yeah. So from the boogie down, I'm just good and brown. <laughs> <laughs> good night, everybody. <laughs> We got we got to keep going. Right, I got like 14 right. more. So if 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 God if God made us this way, right? We're fearfully and wonderfully made, made in the image of God. All of us are made in the image of God. And God, even though He made us in His image, we are now we now have a, a beautiful richness in, in in different skin colors. You guys are you know you're all men. And we could we could start identifying ourselves in different ways. You're a father. You're a husband. You're you're a father. Going to be a husband. Um, I'm a I'm a father. I'm a husband. What what do you think? You, you talked about racism being you, you know one of the th where people kind of ascribe the most value on the color of your skin. That that's what tells people who you are. Do you think that's Do you think that's what God wants people to see is the most important thing about us? Is is just that? Is just is just the color of our skin. I don't think so. I mean, I was debating over this question, and you can 
Ask Tammy, you can ask Whitney. I was just scratching the scalp of my head since I have no hair. <laughs> but our environment has made this part of our identity. It's not by my choice, it's not by your choice. So it's like when you see me in a crowd, some might say, you might, might describe what I'm wearing. Oh, that's Pastor Charles. He's got on a Browns jersey. They're going to lose today. But he's got on a Browns jersey, and he's got on I some. I probably agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still going to support. But if you ask somebody else, they might be like, oh, that's Pastor Charles. That's that black guy right there. Mm. All I want to be is just known as a man of God, a pastor that I would have never thought I would be sitting up here. I mean, my redemption story makes me who I am because that's how God made me. He had me go through so much in this world, but I just want to be known as Pastor Charles, a man of God. So the day that I die, I want people to say, Pastor Charles was a man of God, yeah. not a black man who made sure he wanted to be buried in his jersey. We got you. You got me? Okay. Got you. But... I'm just a man of God, a father, and y'all heard it, soon to be husband, yes, and that's who I am. What about you, Reverend Al? What's the most important thing about you? The most, <laughs> I am not he, she, or it. I am a man. I am first of all, I'm first and foremost, a child of God. And that's my identity. Then every other one attaching husband and a pastor or minister and all of those are secondary. They're not really primary. They're not really all that important. What makes me who I am is I am a son of God, period. That's my identity. That's where I stand. But the other ones, are, they come along with it. But as a child of God, a son of God, that is, that's who I am. And that's why I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I don't care what you think about me, what you think about whether I have color or not. It's no business of mine because I know who I am, a son of God. Nobody can take that away from me. That's my identity. Amen. Amen. Um, I guess that would lead to the next question. It, it is, you know, in, inside of the church, this is supposed to be, this is supposed to be a different atmosphere, different, different, different climate, so to speak. Um, and outside of the church, we understand things happen outside of the church that, that, uh, you, you know, broken world, broken people, all those sorts of things, and, and people do things all the time. But inside, inside of the church, we're supposed, supposed to be brothers and sisters in Christ. And that, that is why we say brothers and sisters in Christ. The identity is found through Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter who our biological mom and dad were. It doesn't matter what region of the world we came from. Um, what matters most is that we identify as, as followers of Jesus. It's why you can go on vacation, go to a church on vacation, hug somebody's neck, and you've got a family member in Christ in a whole other state because we, we have uh, our identity in Christ. With that being said, there's still things that work its way to the church and things happen inside the church that you're like, wish that wasn't there. What are, what are, what, tell us a little bit about your story. Um, because there's, there, you, you know, Reverend L, there's things that happened to you that, uh, that nobody knows about. And j just, just tell us how, how it has impacted your life, how you've seen racism inside the church and what it felt like. It's something that breaks the heart of God. When his children do not know who they are and so start fighting against each other. I'm going to say what happened to me in the church, not for you to say, oh, poor Reverend L, he went through this. No, 
but to let you know that the redemptive power of God, of Jesus Christ, is for every one of us to watch our ways, our words, and what we do as Christians, that there are things that God doesn't take lightly. In Numbers chapter 12, you read from verse 1 to 15, Moses has got the Israelites out of the land of Egypt, and they were coming through the wilderness. And one day, Aaron, his brother, and his sister, Miriam, Moses has married a Cushite woman, which is from an Ethiopian woman. And they say, why did Moses marry that girl? God hates them. Why would they get married? And they were talking about Moses and Moses' wife. Moses didn't hear them. Moses wasn't there. But God was enraged. If you read it, you will see what I'm talking about. Numbers chapter 12 from 1 to 15. Read it on your own. Make sure you read it. Make sure you read it. I mean, make sure you read it. It's serious. Do you want us to read it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's good. It's serious. So, and God said, Moses, I want you to call Aaron and Miriam. I want to talk to three of you. And they showed up at the tent, and the glory of the Lord shows up. And Mo God was angry so much that Miriam became leprous, turned white. Because God said, who are you to talk about my own servant? I talked to Moses face to face. Not like everybody else I talk to in dreams. So, as Christians, we be careful where we say, how we say it. Now, something happened to me in the church. I'm a cool guy. You know me, you know. <laughs> cool the other side of the pillow. Don't say cucumber. So, I was in a church as an associate pastor and a prayer leader and doing all the things that I do. And God was moving, doing what he's doing. Then I decided, when God told me, showed me who I was going to get married to, and I didn't want to keep it secret, so I took my fiancé, to introduce him to my her to my pastor, to introduce her to my pastor, and what was hidden in the secret surfaced, and he said, "You can't do that." I said, "Do what? You're not of the same race." I said, "What do you mean?" She's white, you're black. I said, so? But it's a long story. So, he said, oh, I don't want you to be sitting up there anymore. So, I did not leave the church because it wasn't his church. It's my father's house. He can't kick me out of my father's house. So, I, stay, I took about three seats behind. He thought I was going to get angry and mad and leave the church. I didn't. I was playing my tambourine from back there. And people are asking me, what are you going over there? I said, I just want to be here so I can see what you guys are doing. Because when I sit in front, I don't see who is dancing and who is not. And eventually, he, when he saw that I couldn't be moved... He told me plainly, I don't want you back in the church here. I said, okay. I left. But till today, till he died, I never told a single soul in the church when I left the church, the reason that I left. Because I knew it was not him that was speaking to me. 
that the devil spoke through Judas' carrot to Jesus. So I knew. And I had to call him and we reconciled and prayed about it. And I said, you know what? This is not you. So some of you here who leave the church because somebody said something. If it's your church, I leave it. But if it's the church of Jesus Christ, if it's his house, and you are my brother and you are my sister, there is nothing you can do for me to hate you. We can quarrel and then we settle it. Some people would have left the ministry, would have left the church completely, said, I'm not going to do anything with the church. But I know who I am and who called me and my assignment. And I wouldn't have been here talking to you if I had listened to the devil and what he was saying. So be careful. So that's a, that's a major instance where you, you, you got asked to leave the whole church because you married a, a white woman. You told, me, you told me this the other day. Remember that? Yeah. To, to sh share that because that's, that's something people would say. Oh, that they, yeah. don't, they don't even think about Oh, my goodness. Yeah, they don't even think about it, but it, it kind of hurts a little bit. Went to church. And so they, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what was that? <laughs> church, we are awesome. God is... God is so awesome that he brought all the imperfect people so that he can put perfection in them through him. So somebody in the church said, have I met you before? You look like somebody I know. I said, I don't know. This is my first time in this church. You all look alike. He said, you all look alike. He said, you all look alike. I smiled at him <laughs> because I know what he meant. That's one of those things people say. All black look alike. We all eat chicken and uh, and, and cornbread. Water, cornbread, cornbread, watermelon. Yeah, and we all so cousins. We, we, it comes out from the mouth of a child of God. That ought not to be. What should come out of our mouth is something that be edifying, something encouraging, something that brings somebody closer to you, not mm -hmm. something that pushed them away. Yeah. Yeah, I had a speech teacher in high school that had a sign on her. I've said this through the years, but she had a sign on her uh, wall in the classroom that said, taste your words before you spit them out. Mm. And that, that little sign, you know how some stuff just sticks with you. That's always stuck with me because... There's a lot of things I say, and I'm like, it didn't sound good, you know. Um, even even being a father, you know, you say stuff, and then your kids start repeating stuff, and it's like, well, that doesn't some, sound as good coming out of a two-year-old as it does a 25-year-old, you know. Uh -huh. And that's one of those, I, I wanted you to share that, because that's one of those things that somebody would say, not think a thing of it, and, and don't realize it, it needled you. Yeah. It hurt. Um, what about you? It, what? What, what's something that's, I, I don't know if anything's happened or not, uh, I, but have you ever had anything happen to you that you were? I mean, I can't top that because, you know, I get that all the time too. Uh -huh. You know, don't I know you? No. <laughs> but you can get a chance to know me. You know, being in my little side business or side hustle as a DJ, I come across a lot of different people. And... I like to have fun while I do it. You know, my whole thing is, first of all, when I, before I leave, I ask God to just guide me on my journey. And I do that every single day. I work for a company that, believe it or not, there's only two African Americans that work for Sentara Co-op, only two. And when I started working for Sentara, there were a few farmers who did not want to get fuel from Sentara because their driver was black. <laughs> And a lot of them were like, we're calling. Lord have Listen, I'm just here to deliver you fuel. I'm trying to just do my job and mind my business partner. That's it. And one guy literally came up to me. And this is before the spirit of God took over. 
But that's when I realized I am not who I used to be because this man was putting his finger in my face and I don't want you on my property. Okay, sir, no problem. I'll just leave. But you got to remember, you need fuel, not me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just smiled at him and I just looked up and I said, God, he knows nothing. That is evilness. That is taught. Now this old farmer, he sees me every time and he says, Pastor Charles, will you just pray with me? <laughs> yes, sir. I ain't got a problem with it. And I smile about it. And he just looks at me and he's just like, I would have never thought. And I said, you were taught that, sir. Mm -hmm. You weren't born into it, but you were taught it. And I see it all the time when I DJ, all the time. From last night to when I had a gentleman put his finger in my face and say, you people don't respect our land. Uh, who is you people? And I have this 70-something-year-old man pointing his finger in my face. I'm a child of God. Move your finger out of my face, please, sir. <laughs> my first instinct, I was about to lay the hands on you. But this is how God is. Amen. He teaches us, this is one of your brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And I even, as the guy was walking away, I was like, sir, I will move. I do apologize. I did not know. And I said, as he was walking away, I said, I'm going to pray for you. Well, he let me know I was number one. But I stopped and I prayed for him. You may not like me because of the color of my skin, but I'm still going to pray for you. Amen. The only way I want you not to like me is if I did something. But if I did something, then we discuss it. So it's to me, it's Christianity, correct? Amen. It's not African American anity. It's not Caucasian anity. It is Christianity named after Jesus Christ. So love me for who I am as a child of God. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, you know, all this comes back to in in we're gonna we're gonna kind of land the plane here, but all this comes back to having a having a conversation and understanding that even though something might not be your experience, doesn't mean it hasn't been somebody else's experience, and trying to understand how the person in front of you got to be the person that's in front of you. Um, we're all a collection of a lifetime of experiences, and we might not see everybody's full experiences, but a lot of those experiences created and <coughs> shaped who they are right now. Um, I saw that happen with uh, a good friend of mine who's went on to be with the Lord, with, with uh, my friend Dougie. Y you know, we were out behind his house. We we'd went and, and I think we ate some, we always got together and ate chicken wings. And uh, if anybody who knows me knows, that's my all-time favorite food of all time. And uh, I know I said all-time twice, but that's how much I like them. <laughs> and we were parked behind his house and just talking. You know, we've been friends for, my goodness, I, we ended up being friends for 25 or 30 years. And, you know, we had, we had somebody pull up behind us, lights turned on, and, and you know, he was explaining, oh, this is my house, we're just out here talking what are you doing sitting here? He's like, I'm getting ready to go inside. Got pulled out of the car in front of me. I'm sitting there going, what is going on? Because nothing had happened, you know. Um, I think we'd had worship practice or something that night and, and went and got chicken wings afterwards and I was just taking them home. And, you know, I got to see it firsthand. I'm like, well, I've never experienced that. Um, and I felt, I felt terrible for him. And he just kind of let it roll off of his back. But, you know, for me, I'm like, this is, this is horrible. Um, <laughs> because because we've seen racism being all over the world um and it's not just between african americans and, and, and caucasians right it's, it's between religions and people groups and uh, we, again we've seen some of that play out but there's been this divide between people groups in the united states of america and I have to ask the question because the Bible talks about this so early on in the Old Testament. Um, do you think it's become a generational curse over our country that hasn't been broken off? I do see in our younger generation, especially dealing with our students and, and um, y you know, kids in, in youth ministry, it's not as big of a deal to them. Um, but 
I hear people saying things like, I don't want to continue feeling guilty or responsible for something that I didn't do. I've never, I've never been racist. I've never, I've never been a part of slavery. You, you hear people say things like this. So is what we're experiencing actually a generational curse that needs to be broken off and prayed through and the church lead the way? I'll, I'll let you go on that, Reverend no. Where Where'd your microphone go? <laughs> Just, what did you do? It's right there. I see it. Right there. <laughs> We just love you, Reverend Al. <laughs> See, that's what I'm mean. That's what I'm saying. You're just going to like me the way I am. <laughs> so, I believe it is. And the church have not taken it seriously. Because the world is not going to break the generational curse. That's they don't know what it is. But we, the church, know what it is. And we can only say you know, he will visit the iniquity of the fathers until the third and fourth and generation and tenth generation. So it's happening because the church have not, the church as a whole have not really stepped up to look at what has happened and start speaking, not speaking to individuals, but taking authority over the spiritual demonic activity that's happening in the heavenly realms that is influencing this activity in the church. There has to be a serious repentance. There has to be a serious repentance. Somebody heard when I shared this story about what happened to me and it happened to know the congregation and what he did was really surprised me. We were in a, a prayer meeting one day and he brought a bucket and washed my wife's feet right there said, I repent on behalf of my denomination. I repent on behalf of my denomination for what they did to you. And both myself, my wife, himself, the people in there were just crying. Mm. We were just crying. I think that's the kind of repentance that God is looking for the Christians to really own. Je uh, Jeremiah, the prophets, they repented for the sins of their fathers, not, not their own. Their own. Daniel prayed to God, forgive the sins of I and my fathers and so on. When the church really take it serious, we can break this generational curse of racism. That's why it's not disappearing. And the church being able to open your heart and let Jesus be the Jesus that like Samaritans, anybody coming to Jesus and they are welcome because Jesus is Jesus. Yeah. And we can say Jesus is Jesus. He can do it. He gave you his spirit. Amen. Everything that Jesus has, he said, I give it to you. So you can live like me here on earth. It is possible. Church, we can break this curse. Especially in our congregation. I know everybody's looking at me here, looking like an angel. But for the fact that. Somebody here, depending on where you were raised, what you have heard, where you were brought up, there's somehow element of that tiny race issue. I might not call it racism, but maybe prejudice or bias are still lingering. You have to repent and confess it and let Jesus deal with it so that our church in particular will flow with the power and the Holy Spirit that God wants to release amongst us. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. One little person doing it in secret, thinking that nobody sees me when I do, when I say what I act, when I think. He saw Miriam and Aaron, and he didn't take it lightly. Please, let us get our hearts clear. 
and pure before God. Amen. I think that's going to be a good place to land today. I love the fact that you brought up that there are times, even in the Old Testament, where we see people re repent for sins that they didn't commit. Mm -hmm. But the lingering after, after effects of, of what those sins were continued to affect generation after generation after mm -hmm. generation. And we end where we started. It's what we're seeing play out in the Middle East right now mm -hmm. where a household had sin enter the household. Mm -hmm. And we are still, we are still dealing with what Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar contrived in that household. We're still dealing with it all of these centuries later mm -hmm. because things didn't change. And so that's the choice that we have to make. Yep, maybe we didn't, maybe, maybe you've never done anything. Uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you've never perpetrated that, that, that sin, said those words. But I think as a church, getting together and just saying, you know what, we don't want to be that church. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be known for Amen. that. We want to be known for being able. I, I want to be known as, I, I want to be known for a church that when you look across our congregation, Amen. It, doesn't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't look like one thing. It's every nation, tribe, mm. and tongue coming together. Because that's what heaven's going to be like. That's if right. We don't exactly. Believe, if we don't believe God sees color, why does the Bible say, why, why, why does it say that he sees a man, that he sees a number that no man can number? And, mm. and, and, and there's literally every nation, tribe, and tongue mm. in that number. It's mm -hmm. because it's there. So the church on earth, Earth should look like it's going to look like in heaven. Amen. The only way we get there is on purpose. The only way we get there is by embracing cultural mm -hmm. diversity. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the things that, you know, some of the things that if you really read about cultural diversity in the church, there's, there's, there's so many interesting articles out there And it. I got to tell you, as a pastor, it raised some things up on the inside of me where I'm like, Lord, am I, am I, am I guilty of this? Um, I can tell you, I, I, I can tell you one of the statistics that I read that was just shocking to me was most multicultural churches in our country are, are mega churches. They're multiple thousands of people. Most of them are pastored by white men. And when the church, now you can agree with me or disagree with me on this, but you can find the state. These are just statistics. Okay. I'm just giving you numbers. And if numbers aren't important, there's a whole book in the Bible named numbers so they think they matter to God <laughs> but statistically when a multicultural church is no longer predominantly white but it, com it becomes predominantly uh, other ethnicities the white the white part of the congregation starts to dissipate until eventually there's very few white people left in the congregation in other words when when we lose control we leave and it, it is, is what the statistics would suggest that kind of made me feel a certain sort of way, you know, and I wanted to be indignant, be like, I would still go and blah, blah, blah. But I couldn't think of one church where those statistics weren't true because I know multicultural congregations. I know the pastors. I know, I know they're usually large churches. And I, I still know even in that multicultural congregation that for the most part, it's 70-30 it's, it's or 80-20. Um, and they're, 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 doing the best, they're doing the best they can, but it's still slanted. We we want to we want to be intentional, you know. One of the reasons I wanted to deal with this was moving forward. You know, if the Lord doesn't come back, which mm -hmm. He could come back in the mm -hmm. next six minutes, who knows? Amen. But which would be fine too. Um, Can I just say yeah. what the Holy Spirit dropped in my heart right sure. now? The Holy Spirit said to me, "Pursue relationship, not race." While you were talking, I just heard that. I said, tell them to pursue relationship, not race. Amen. And I think the big thing is get to, get to know. Mm. We are all child of God. Get to know someone. It, 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 I saw that same stat also. And, and I just, I, I, I was confused about that throughout the entire day. If the Lord blesses me one of these days, with the church, I want everybody to come. Anybody that will listen. Anybody that will listen to the word that God has given me to give to you. Get to know somebody. Not just because of their skin, but just get to know them as a human being. Because we're all human. We all hurt the same. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, we all bleed the same. 
Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, before I close in prayer, would you just give Pastor Charles and Reverend mm. L a round of applause for sharing mm. their story, their ministry, parts of their past that you didn't, that, that you might not have known. Um, you know, I've known Reverend L since I was about 15, 14 years old. And uh, that makes me old. Uh, well, <laughs> we won't say how old you are, but... You know, I learned some things about him through these conversations that even I didn't know. I didn't know all of that about you and Donna and what you guys had gone through to get to where you're at. And uh, it just makes me love you, love you so much more. Appreciate you. you so much more. I want to We've been married for 37 years. 37 years she's been putting up with you. So. Yeah. She's a, she's a keeper. Let's pray. Father, we... We know we just we, we can't commit to one prayer that breaks mm. off the the generational curse that's mm -hmm. that's hanging over our country and even over the, the body. But Lord, we need to start being intentional and linking our arms and just saying, you know what, God, I don't I don't want to be a part of the problem. I want to be a part of the solution. Mm. Lord Jesus, we want to be a church where anybody who needs you can come. No matter how broken, no matter how bitter, no matter how bad their past is or how bad their present even is. And it does not matter what color of skin they have. Lord Jesus, we want to be intentional about letting people know this is a place where you can come and you can be accepted, you can be loved, and you can be a part of something great. You can be a part of the body of Christ. Lord Jesus, if there's anything in us that's displeasing to you, if we've had any kind of prejudice, we've allowed to loosely fall from our lips, Lord Jesus, pierce our hearts and convict us of sin and righteousness. Lord, just want to be the people that you've created us to be. I thank you for my brothers that are sitting beside of me. Lord, I thank you for, for the friendship that's that started between Charles and I over the last few years. I thank you for really a decades-long friendship now with Reverend L and what they mean, Lord, just in my walk with you, not, not, not as, as, as a member of this church, but Lord, just in my walk with you and all that they've done and said and in and, and times they've been there when I needed somebody, Lord Jesus, they've shown up time and time again. I pray, Father, that we would be that type of church and Father, that you would allow, that you would allow this church to be a multicultural church that is powerful and impacting, and it takes ground away from the enemy. That's what we want, Lord Jesus. Today, Father, use us wherever we go. You have called us to be salt and light. You've called us to be a city that's set upon a hill that cannot be hidden. And Father, as we go our separate ways today, use us everywhere we go in that way. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. We will see you next week for our second to last hot potato. Can't wait to see you. Set all of our hearts ablaze.